Good morning, everyone. I'm not getting a very light special here. All right, we'll just go with this. Well, again, good morning. <laughs> Real quick, apologize for that. You know, I don't know what's going on with this wireless, but it's not working right now. So, uh, again, I want to say welcome this morning. And of course, uh, we mentioned this in Bible class and uh, you know, actually announced it Wednesday night. But we're so excited that Bob and Judy Bai have placed their membership with this congregation. We're excited to get to know them more, get to work with them. Uh, more, and we just want to welcome them to the family here. And also, uh, one of the things that we need to do this afternoon or the, immediately after our morning service, if the men would gather for just a few moments in the back room, uh, the refrigerator in the back is not operating correctly, so we're going to have to buy a refrigerator. And y'all know with things like that, there's money involved, and so we need to kind of set a budget of what we're looking at. And so it shouldn't take very long. So after our services, take about a five minute, get to visit around, but then the men be together in the back and we need to uh, talk about uh, what we need to do in regard to this refrigerator. So anyway, this morning, and you realize that we've been going through, and uh, I'm gonna have to get used to not backing away from the microphone because I'm used to that wireless. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, Bible stories, and we've spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, so what I thought we would do uh, this morning is to change it up a little bit. We're not trying to do them in chronological order, all that. When you looked at it, that's what I was doing, and I thought, well, there's no need for that. So we're going to mix it up. Hopefully that'll uh, keep everybody awake a little bit more, and you won't doze off, so I'm joking. But anyway, we are going to kind of mix it up. But this morning, we want to look at one of the, the greatest men that ever lived. We're going to look at the life of a man that we refer to as John the Baptist. And, of course, you realize that John the Baptist is a translation uh, taken out of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, the, the literal meaning of his name is John the Immerser. John the Immerser. And he immersed people, and we'll see it in a few moments, for the remission of sins. And by the way, we often point out when we're studying with people, it says John is the Baptist, not a Baptist. And there's a world of difference between those two concepts. John is the one who immersed the people, preparing them for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to read together in Matthew chapter 3, and beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, in those days came John the Baptist, or as we said a moment ago, John the Immerser, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now Matthew uh, gives us an idea of who this man is in verse number three. He says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle, leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And I'm going to pause there if you were at the uh, lectureship at made by it last Saturday during the question, not yesterday, but a week ago. During the question and answer, one of the uh, kids, I think they said he was like the fifth grade, said, what did John say? That's what he ate. And by the way, there's still a lot of cultures today that like to eat locusts or grasshoppers. Uh, they'll eat all kinds of things, crickets and stuff. But it's not uncommon for someone to make a meal of this. And so John's, Bible, the Bible says his raiment was of camel's hair. Uh, I don't know that you can buy that today. Can you just go down and go down to Walmart and find a camel's hair? I don't, I don't think that they're real popular in our culture today. Uh, if I understand, it was a rather rough garment. Uh, uh, it, it was used for someone who lived their life outside, out of doors, and so uh, it would protect them from the, the rain and so forth. So this is a man 
that by all standards would be kind of a rough individual, at least by looking at him. He's got this uh, raiment of camel's hair. He's got a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Verse 5, the Bible says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Verse 6 says, And they were baptized of him in Jordan, the Bible says, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. And of course, viper is a, a, a venomous snake. And he said, you are poisonous, you are venomous snakes. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Now I'm going to drop down the peg there. By the way, it's not unreasonable for us to ask people when they repent to bring forth fruits worthy that are meat, that, that fit the repentance that you say. Uh, we talked about it again at the, the Maybank Legislative. You can't just steal a million dollars and say, well, I'm sorry I stole a million dollars, but I'm going to keep it and I'm going to spend it the way that I want. Repentance, at least as much as is possible, demands a restitution of what you've done. And so he says to this generation of vipers, these Pharisees and Sadducees, you need to bring forth fruits worthy, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our fathers, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, brethren, this is something, and, and we'll go into the life of John in a moment, but I want you to think about this. Uh, it doesn't matter what our DNA is. It matters what our heart is, what our Bible heart is. And uh, John is telling these people, don't boast in the fact that you are descendants of Abraham. Well, that was not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees who did that. That was the entire Jewish nation. They looked down on everything around them because they felt they were better than them because they were children of Abraham. And John says, God can take a rock out there and he can raise up a child of Abraham. And as we've said on other occasions, if you were to be able to do this, if God did that, raised up from a rock, a descendant of Abraham, you did a do a DNA test, and guess what? He would be a descendant of Abraham. That's how powerful our God really is. And so he said, don't boast in the fact that you are children of Abraham. That's not going to do you any good because God can raise up from a rock a child of Abraham. And now notice what he says in verse 10. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Notice that John, although he doesn't have to, he explains what he's saying. He says, therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff when a, with unquenchable or unquenchable fire. I want us to think about this man that we're talking about by the name of John. And I believe for us to fully understand John, who he is, the mission that he had, we need to go back into the Old Testament because there are prophecies, as we read a moment ago, uh, where he says in verse number 3, where Matthew records, this is the one that Isaiah was talking about in the Old Testament. And so we need to go back into the Old Testament and look at these prophecies concerning who John is. So I ask you to open in your Bible to the book of Isaiah, and we want to go to the 40th chapter. And by the way, there's a lot of information in this chapter 
that I wish that we had time to uh, talk about. But uh, God uh, calls Isaiah to preach against the people of his day. And he tells them that he should, or God tells Isaiah he should cry. And, and Isaiah said in verse number six, well, what do you want me to cry? And he says, now watch this, all flesh shall be, shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, verse six, and all the goodness thereof is the flower of the field. Of course, you remember that that's going to be quoted in the New Testament. But let's look at the verses about John. He says in verse three, Isaiah prophesies, the voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse four, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough place is plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So I want you to notice that Isaiah made this prophecy concerning John and he said John is going to be the one whose voice is going to be heard crying in the wilderness and his mission is stated he is to prepare the way for the Lord. He is to make, the Bible says, the way of the Lord is going to be straight. It's going to be a highway. And, and he's talking about every valley being raised up. Have you watched when they, they actually make a road? Well, what is the best way to make a road? Well, you try to make it as straight and level as possible, right? And so they take the mountains and they fill in the valleys and they make and so what John's mission is, and he's just using this as an illustration of what John is to do. He's to tear down. You remember what God said to Jeremiah, I want you to tear down, I want you to pluck, I want you to destroy, and then I want you to build up again. That's Jeremiah chapter one. But what is God saying to Jeremiah? You've got to get this people straightened out. And so John is preparing people for the coming of the Messiah. And he goes on to talk about this Messiah later in Isaiah chapter 40, but we want to continue on. Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3, the last of the Old Testament prophets. You remember that Malachi writes about 400 years before the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you remember that Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament canon or the Old Testament scriptures. And so Malachi is, and I would say it like this, the next to the last of the Old Testament prophets. And what I mean by that, John is going to be the next prophet of God that God is going to call and raise up. But Malachi is the last of the prophets to write a book and then God seals the Old Testament canon, the Old Testament scriptures, and there is a 400-year period of silence. Now, we know that we can go into secular history. We can see a lot of the changes that took place uh, in the nation of Israel during that 400-year period of silence, but God had not said a word for 400 years. And then John arises. So Malachi, the last to write a book in the Old Testament. By the way, we know for one, have you heard, I mentioned this last week, I was uh, talking about, uh, uh, well, no, this was at the relationship in May, I was talking about the inspiration of the Bible and one of the things that sets the, the Bible above every other book that claims to be religious writings. And I pointed out, you can do it on your phone, not right now, but you can do it on your phone. You can do a Google search. And you can type. You can type in, you know, the oldest religious manuscripts. And guess what? You're not going to find in a lot of those lists. They do the top ten or the top twenty. You're not going to find the Hebrew Scriptures, the most ancient of writings, and they ignore. You know why? Because they don't like the Bible. They don't believe in it. And I'm saying this. 
as a general rule, people don't like the Bible, they don't like what it says, and they're not going to even give it the credibility of something, one text that they were talking about was found in a coffin. And it was uh, written in this coffin of this man. And uh, boy, this is one of the most ancient religious texts that we've ever found. And yet we've got right here is writings from Moses to live 2,500 or 1,500 years before Jesus came. And we're talking about scriptures that are 4,500 years old. And so, no, 3,500, my math's not good. So we're talking about ancient writings here. But the thing is, we know that the Jews had what we now call the Old Testament scriptures. They had it. Malachi was the last book that was written. We know that for a fact. And not only do we know that, but we know that during this period of silence, about 200 years after Malachi writes his book, these Old Testament scriptures were actually translated into the Greek language. So those that claim, well, Jesus just took the Old Testament scriptures and manipulated them to make it sound as if he said, did he know? These Old Testament scriptures were written, sealed, and then translated into another language. So how is Jesus going to tamper with that? How is he going to just manipulate the text to make it sound, oh no, we know these are all false claims. But look at what Malachi said in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1. He says, Behold, this is of course God speaking. I will send my messenger, by the way, there in the Hebrew it's Malach, which means angel. He said, I will send my messenger, my spokesman, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord Watch this, and the Lord whom you see, the Messiah that you're looking for, watch what he says, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But then the powerful question of verse 2, but who's going to abide in the day of his coming? We're not going to read the rest of that, but what is Malachi saying? Malachi is saying, God is going to send someone who is going to pave the way for Jesus Christ. And then the Lord, the one that you're seeking, the Messiah that you're seeking, will suddenly, did you see that? He will suddenly appear or come to his temple. Do you remember when Jesus started his earthly ministry in John chapter 2? You remember one of the first things that Jesus did is he goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple. Remember the reading of John 2 and verse 15? He took and he wove together a small scourge and then he used that scourge to drive out the money changers from the temple. So that brings new light to what Malachi said. The one that the Lord sent, he will come suddenly in the temple, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Here is this boy that is carpenter boy by all the people that know him. He comes into the temple of God, he weaves together a scourge, and he drives out the money changers, overthrows the temple, and he, he those that sold them. This is what John, or excuse me, Malachi was talking about. He's going to come suddenly into the temple, and he's going to bring a new covenant. And you're delighting in that. But who's going to abide in the day when he comes? See, Jesus was not what they thought he was going to be. But Malachi prophesied in the Old Testament. I want to go to chapter 3, or excuse me, Malachi chapter 4. Notice the concluding text of the Old Testament scriptures. Talking about John. He says... Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So those are the Old Testament scriptures pointing to the coming of this great man that we call John the Baptist. I want to spend a little bit of time 
in talking about John's birth. The Old Testament prophecies ended with the birth of John and the mission that he was going to do in the nation of Israel. I would say probably that there's more information about the birth of John in the Bible than any other person except maybe Jesus Christ. We have more revealed about the birth of John than any other person uh, except for Jesus. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1. And let's see the events surrounding the birth of this great man. So we want to turn to Luke chapter 1 and verse number 5. It says, There were, or there was, in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias. Now we'll talk about it more in just a moment. Well, no, I, I, I'll, I'll just go on. That Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abai, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. A little bit of background, you realize this, by the time the temple has come, there are so many men that fit the requirements to be priests that they actually did it by courses. And so you would have the descendants of Abai that would come to the temple at a certain time, and they would actually be the ones that functioned. And I don't remember the length. It was maybe a month, whatever the time period was. Uh, they would stay. They would do all the priestly things, and then they would leave, and the next force would come in. And so he is of the family of Abai. His wife is one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name is Elizabeth. Verse number six, and you ought to think about the implications of this verse. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. He doesn't say they were sinless people, but we're talking about a, a man and a woman who are exemplary among God's people. They walked in the Old Testament law with our lips saying, blameless. Well, that's, that's a hard <laughs> act to follow, is it not? And so we go to verse 7. They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in age. They were getting older, and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, that's what we're talking about, it was his turn to be there as a priest, he says, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So we find that his job as one of the priests is to be one of the ones that burns incense in the temple before the Lord. It says in verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at that time of incense, and or at the time of incense, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name Joy. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Now amazingly, you think about what Zechariah said, you're going to have a son. Well, I'm an old man, but you're going to have a son. And this son is going to be a great man. And many people are going to listen to his message. And many people are going to come and be obedient to the message that he brought. Remember what we read in Malachi 4 in verse number 6? He's going to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the children's heart to their father. He's going to restore things to a way that is going to be pleasing to God. Verse 17. And he shall go before him. That's God, remember, but we're talking about in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He shall go before him in the spirit 
and power of Elias. That's the Old Testament prophet Elijah in the Greek. It's Elias. He says to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You think about the mission of John, and we'll talk about it in a moment, the greatness of the mission that he has been given by God. And here is Zechariah, his father, hearing that. And Zechariah, in verse 18, says unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? How am I going to know that's going to actually come to pass, angel? He says, For I am an old man, verse 18, and my life well stricken in age. And then, verse 19, the angel answered him. And he said, I am Gabriel, and stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. It says in verse 21, the people waited for Zacharias and, excuse me, marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away the, my reproach among Men. Now, we're not going to read any further into this text, but it, because it transitions now to the conception and birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the events that surround that. But I want you to think about what Zechariah was told. You're going to have a son. This son is going to be a great son. He's going to bring the fathers back to the children, the children back to their fathers. He's going to help the disobedient see the wisdom of what God has given them, and he is going to prepare a people from the Lord or for the Lord. And so Zacharias, doubting the word of this angel, is now stricken dumb. And I don't know how long he was in Jerusalem doing his ministry as a priest, but then he goes home. Then his wife gets pregnant. And then the child is going to be born. So he didn't talk for at least nine months, if not longer. He's not able to speak because God said through this prophet, you're not going to say a word until these things are accomplished. So let's notice when the things are accomplished. Skip down to verse 39. This is Mary, the mother of our Lord. She arose in those days, verse 39, and went into the hill country with haste. This is after she had been told she was going to be uh, with child of the Holy Ghost. And so she arose in those days, went into the hill country with haste, into the city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And when it came to pass, or it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, watch this, the babe leaped in the womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Not only was Elizabeth filled with the Holy Ghost, but John was at that point as well. Remember what we read a moment ago in verse number 15. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost even while he's in his mother's womb. And so here is Elizabeth. She hears the voice of Mary, and this babe leaked in her womb. Now, I'm not going to chase this rabbit very far, but here's the text that shows us that a child in the womb is a child. It is not a lump of tissue. It's not a clump. It's not a max. It is a child. And as we've said on other occasions, the Greek word for a child is brekos. And it's used for a child outside the mother's womb. And it's used in this text for a baby still in the mother's womb. God doesn't say, 
this fetus, and I realize fetus is nothing more than Latin for baby, uh, and isn't it amazing that we've allowed that word to change in its meaning? Well, a fetus, what does that mean? Well, in the Latin, it means a baby. Well, what do we mean? Well, it's just a clump of cells. It's a fetus. So we don't even know what we're talking about when we start making silly arguments like that. This child, this breathless in its mother's womb is alive and it hears the salutation of what's going on and uh, notice he leaped in his mother's womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe watched this leaped in my womb for joy. Now we know it's been proven now scientifically that infants still in their mother's womb experience emotions. They demonstrated this through this new concept that they have of the ultrasound. They can actually do what is it, a 3D or 4D ultrasound that they're doing now. They keep doing better and better. But they can actually see a child. They can see when a child is afraid. Do you know that they have actually, they've been doing the ultrasounds when they're giving an abortion, they follow. The reason they do that is because they want to make sure nothing stays in the mother that's going to cause an infection, an infection. And they said that when it, the process starts, you can see the baby trying to get away from this instrument of death. They know that a child can feel pain. And that's why I'm so thankful that we've gotten some of these laws that are being passed. And I pray that when these things finally come before the Supreme Court, I think it's going to be later this summer, if they will have enough sense to look at an ultrasound and say, that is a living human being. Now, I'm not going to preach more on that. This babe in the womb leaped for joy. He had joy when he heard the voice of Mary. Don't tell me this is a clump of massive cells, a clump of tissues, this is a living child that has emotions like fear and joy. And that child leaped in the mother's womb because of that joy. Verse 45. And in bless, this is Elizabeth continuing her insp inspired statement about Mary and about Jesus. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from our Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of a low degree or of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath opened his servants. That's an uh, 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 archaic way of saying he's helped. Do you remember old folks saying that openly? You, you used to hear old folks use that terminology. You don't hear it much anymore. I remember especially out in West Texas, you would hear that phraseology all the time. Uh, but it says in verse 54, he has helped or he has opened his uh, servant Israel in remembrance of his uh, mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And a Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now it's the full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son and her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had shown great mercy upon her and they rejoiced with her and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they called his name Zacharias after the name of his father 
And his mother answered and said, Not so, but it, he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that, called, that is called by this name. And they made signs unto the father how he would have him called. Notice that in verse number 63, he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying his name is John, and they marveled. Verse 64, his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake, and he praised God. And it says a little bit later on in verse 67 that his father now is filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesies about not only the work of his son John, but about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you remember that in this prophecy, he says in verse number 79, he's going to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. So that is the statements that we find around John. But what is one of the messages that John is going to give? We'll see that in just a moment. I want you to think about the greatness of the mission of John. Can you imagine being given a mission of this magnitude? And yet John is a man who is up to the job. And I want us to all recognize, brethren, there are many things that God has asked for us to do, and he's not going to ask us to do something we cannot do. So, brethren, think about the greatness of the mission of John. The writer John, the apostle John, is going to talk about John the baptizer, and we'll go to John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. You remember he begins this? chapter this book by talking about Jesus Christ. It says in the beginning was the word. Verse 1 the word was with God. The word was God. But he says in verse number 6 there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now watch verse 8. He was not that light. Jesus was not or excuse me John was not the Messiah. He was pointing to Jesus, but notice his mission is to help people and bear witness of the light. Now, he's not that light, verse 8, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And then, of course, he moves on to talk about Jesus Christ. So we consider for just a moment the demeanor of John. We read it a moment ago in Matthew chapter 3. So we're not going to reread those first 12 verses, but just highlight in your mind, it says John was the one that Isaiah, back to Matthew 3, in verse 3, John was the one that Isaiah prophesied that he's going to come and he's going to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord. He's going to make his path straight. That's what it meant a moment ago when the valleys are going to be raised and the hills are going to be lowered. He's talking about making this path straight for the Lord. And so Isaiah talks about this John, and this John, verse 2, is in the wilderness, and he is preaching the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was preparing them for the coming kingdom that Jesus is going to build in just a matter of a few years. And so, the demeanor of John, he wore a raiment of camel's hair, had a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And he was a fearless preacher of the word of God. And he even tells these people, you, you are acting like a bunch of snakes. And you need to repent. And you need to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And so, that is the demeanor of John. Here's something that you might find very interesting. John, who is the first prophet after Malachi, and in that sense, the last of the Old Testament prophets, never worked a miracle. He never worked a miracle. You know that miracles were given, and we could go to John uh, chapter 20, we don't have time, but in verse 30, miracles basically are given 
to say that this person is a spokesman for God. Now, John didn't have the ability to do miracles. Now, remember, his mother and his father both prophesied about him. So the people saw what Zacharias did. They saw what Elizabeth did. And so they marked that, apparently, in their mind. And now their son comes of age, but he's just, can we say it like this, a preacher of the gospel. He doesn't have the ability to work miracles. Let's turn, if you would, to John chapter 10. And, I, and I'm going to show you why I would say he doesn't work any miracles, because I want you to have these verses for your own study. John 10. It says in verse number 40, or excuse me, verse number 41, John 10 and verse 41, many resorted unto him, that's Jesus. They came to Jesus, and they said, watch this, John did no miracle. So that's why we would say that John didn't have the ability for a They didn't see a miracle. But I want you to notice the next phrase. They don't end there. He didn't work miracles, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him. So John, even in the greatness of his mission, God said, this man I am not going to endow with miraculous capabilities. And so his mission is very clear. We've already read from Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. So let's turn to Mark chapter 1. And by the way, these, these verses are not, uh, uh, some have suggested that perhaps they contradict one another. No, they, they simply help uh, fill in all the information so they complement one another. They're not a contradiction. They're a complement. And so some of the things that Matthew didn't say about John, Mark is going to say about John. And some of the things that Mark does not say, then uh, Dr. or excuse me, John is going to say as well. So let's notice this. We're talking about his ministry, and it says in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse number 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of of sins. Now, brethren, it's, it, it's important for us to understand that John's baptism was for the remission of sins. And by the way, I don't know of anybody that has argued. You know, when you start talking about baptism today, and you start talking about the essentiality of baptism, and you mention, for instance, in Acts 2 and verse 38, when Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you know what people will say in that instance? Well, it's not for in order to gain. It's because of. You were baptized, they argue, because your sins were already forgiven. They never argue that about John. Isn't that interesting? John... You're preaching baptism for repentance and for the remission of sins, but it's all, your sins have already been remitted. It's ridiculous that we would argue things like that. What did John do? He preached, the Bible says, the baptism for of repentance, and it is for the remission of sins. So John's baptism, designed by God, was to remit people's sins. Now, that's important as you go through and study the rest of the New Testament. But we don't have time to do that this morning. So, so we're not going to study the entirety of what's all involved in baptism for the remission of sins. But I want you to know that John's baptism remitted the sins of those people that obeyed it. So verse 5, there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John, again, was clothed with camel's hair, with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and he preached. Now remember what we read a moment ago? 
Do you remember what we read uh, in uh, John chapter 10? That John did no miracles, but everything that he said about Jesus Christ came to pass. So John preached this. Verse 7, there's one coming after me. The one, there cometh one mightier than I. After me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Now remember when we read Matthew's account, he didn't bring that particular thought up. So here's the complimentary text. What did John say? There's somebody coming after me, and this person is mightier than I am. And I am not even worthy to reach down and unloose his shoes. Help him take off his shoes. John is a mighty man. I am the verse 8 have baptized you with water. So what do we learn from this? We learn from this that John's baptism was for the remission of sins and it was to be done in water. And there had to be a lot of water, so it's not sprinkling, it's not pouring. There was a lot of water. Remember, John is baptizing uh, in the Jordan River outside of Adon, I believe it is. I'm, I'm quoting that, so you'll have to look it up. Because there was much water there. So what does this tell us about baptism? Remember what we said about John saying, the immerser. He immersed people in water. So he said, I'm going to baptize you in water. But there's coming one who will baptize you, he says, with the Holy Ghost and remember and with fire, according to what we read a moment ago in the book of Matthew. I want you to know that he had a great mission. And that great mission is found in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I want you to look at what we find beginning in verse 29. By the way, in your outline, uh, under point number four, under that second point, his mission, I left out John chapter one, and I just saw that. So it's John 1, 29 through 34. So let's read those verses together. John 1, 29 through 34. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which uh, taketh away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said. Now watch, this is the one I was talking about. After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. Remember what? He's mightier than I. Not even worthy to unlatch his so, uh, shoes off his feet. So he says, he is preferred before me. Watch this. For he was before me. Now if you do the chronology, John is six months older than Jesus by birth. But what did John say? Oh, he came a long time before that. Why don't we know what John is talking about? He is saying just what John reported in John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You go down to verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John, the immerser, is telling those people, by the way, we can even say John the Apostle, who's not an apostle at this point, he hadn't even called it, but he's saying to those people that are listening to his voice, this is the one that I was talking about. That is mightier than I. I can't even unloose his shoes. And he said that he came before me. He was before me. Wait a minute, I'm older than him. No, in a physical sense, yes. But in the grand scheme of things, Jesus Christ has always existed. He is God. And he's always existed. So John can rightly say, even though I'm six months older than this man, Jesus has always been. He is before me. He was before me. Verse 31. And I did not. I did not. If you all in when I started my earthly ministry, John is saying, and when I started preaching this message, by the way, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, John is saying, I didn't understand all of it. I didn't know who he was. I didn't really grasp everything about him. He said, I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, 
upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him the same as he uh, which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I, and I saw, now remember we stopped reading in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 3. If we had kept reading in verse 13 and going through the end of the chapter, we would have the baptism of Jesus Christ. It's recorded by Matthew. It's recorded by Mark, Luke, John. And so we would have the baptism of Jesus. Jesus comes to John. I want to be baptized. No, I can't baptize you. You're great tonight. Jesus said, allow it to happen. And he did. And you remember that John, they went down in the water. John immersed Jesus. And immediately a voice out of heaven, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And so John said, now I didn't know exactly who I was talking about. But then when I saw the Spirit come upon him, this is verse 33, descending and remaining on him, I immediately knew that Jesus was, watch this, verse 34, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. What a great, great mission that John had. And then to the Sabbath part. John said, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And I say this is the sad part. I, I, I'm saying that merely from a human perspective. In the eyes of God, this is exactly what God wanted to have. I, I say want, God intended to have. He, he, he didn't want John to be beheaded in the sense, oh, I want John to have. But this was what God had planned all along. And so in Luke 3, in verse 19, the Bible, at least I'm reading from the King James Version, said, but Herod the Tetrarch. Now we're going to read more of that in just a moment, but I want to tell you what the word Tetrarch means. It literally means ruler of one fourth. That's the literal print. That's the word the Bible and say, how can you call Herod a king? Now, this is not Herod the Great. That's Herod the Tetrarch's dad is Herod the Great. So how could, they, how could biblical writers refer to Herod the Tetrarch as a king? Because he was a king over one fourth of his daddy's kingdom. The kingdom divided among the four sons. And he was one of the rulers, so he was king in every sense of the word. He just wasn't king over what all his daddy was king over, but that doesn't change anything. So, this Herod that we're talking about is called Herod Antipas in history. He's one of the sons of Herod the Great. I just explained that a moment ago. But you remember that Herod is the one, Herod the Tetrarch, was the one who killed, the, or excuse me, Herod the Great is the one who killed the children of Bethlehem. But Herod the Tetrarch was the one who married his brother Philip's wife in violation of God's law. So I, I hope I didn't get you all mixed up with that. <laughs> so let me say it again. So I, I, I just know you know what I'm talking about. So Herod <laughs> the Great killed the children of Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Herod the Tetrarch, his son called Antipas, I, in that sentence I didn't write it very well, married his brother's wife, Philip. Uh, he married Philip's wife. So this is Herod the Tetrarch that we're talking about in this passage of Scripture. So let's notice again the passage of Scripture that we're talking about in Luke 3 and verse 19. Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him, that is by John, for Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife. So Philip had a wife. And Herod, the Tetrarch, Philip's brother, ruler over one fourth of his daddy's kingdom, fell in love with his brother's wife. And they committed adultery. She ended up divorcing Philip, and she ended up marrying Herod, the Tetrarch. All of that's a violation of the will of God. The adultery that started the whole process between Herod and Herodias. And then, of course, the ultimate divorce. She divorces her husband, and then she marries her brother-in-law. And you talk about, we think things are 
whole thing for so long. You know, things haven't changed. We got we talked about this. That's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes one and verse number nine. So uh, I guess, and I can't call his name. He was the talk show guy that had everybody. Uh, Mar Mar is that his name? You know, everybody came on the show and told all of the sort of detail. I guess Mari would be trying to find these people and, and, and talk to them about their lifestyle, you know, and, and the lifestyle of the rich people, you know, that they were sinful people. And Herod, his daddy was a sinful man. Herod the Tetrarch was a sinful man. And so it says, he, he says that he, John preached about him marrying his brother Philip's wife, but also... For all, verse 19, all the evils which Herod had done. He didn't just stop with this adulterous marriage. He brought up everything that Herod the Tetrarch had done. He was a faithful preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, added yet, verse 20, above all, that he shut up John in prison. So God said the primary mark of Herod the Tetrarch's sin is he locked John in prison because he didn't like the message that he preached. And so, we know, and, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 4 very quickly. We're going to wrap this up quickly. You remember that uh, John condemned the sin that we read a moment ago. And I have Matthew 4, and that's not the right verse. It's Matthew 11. <laughs> Matthew 11. <coughs> yeah, I've got Matthew 4. four oh, 14. That, I can't even read my own writing when it's typed. <laughs> Matthew 14 is the verse that I'm looking for. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, verse 1, heard the people. Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Uh, remember that uh, Herod the Tetrarch's not the only one saying that. A lot of people were saying this is she, uh, John, Jesus is John come back from the dead. And so Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip, uh, his brother Philip's wife. Uh, verse 4, John said, Worship, it is not lawful for thee to have her. You know, uh, preachers give a lot of condemnation sometimes when they preach God's law of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And people will come to you and they will lay out their marriage situation and you'll say, well, that's, that's not what the Bible says. You, you're not married according to the teachings of the Bible. And you know what? People are just like here, they get mad as a woman. They say something like, I've been married this lady for 30 years, and we got children together. What do I do with those children? And, and, and I've said this sometimes. What did you do to the children from your first marriage? You left them behind. You didn't even play child support, support and now you're going to play the daddy card? That doesn't work very good with me, brethren. It makes me mad. I think you can tell that. It does. Oh, I'm a father to these kids. Well, what about those kids that you left? Mm, 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 mm. So, it's not lawful, verse 4, for you to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared that Herod said he's going to kill him right then. But he feared the multitude because they counted John as a prophet. But then Herod's birthday comes along and his daughter, uh, the daughter of Herodias, danced before them. I told you this would make it on whatever that show was that I was talking about earlier. So now he's got his stepdaughter dancing a provocative dance in front of him for his birthday. And guess what? He being like a bunch of dumb men are. See this young girl dancing immodestly and provocatively. I I'll give you half my kingdom. I'll leave my wife and my kids and I'll bury you. That's what, that's what people are all oh, got him, you know. And so I'm going to leave them all in, forget them, I'm not going to marry this young one over here. That's, that, this, this is sordid, brethren. And he had promised, verse 7, with an oath to give her whatever you ask. And she, before being instructed by her lovely mother, 
who is a godly woman, said, Give me John's head on a plaque in a chart. Well, didn't fall far from that tree. She's a wicked woman, and she's got a wicked daughter, and that two want to get. And because of that, John is beheaded. Verse 9, he was sorry. He didn't want to do it. And remember, he was mad enough when John said, you don't have a right to her. He was mad enough to kill him right then. Now he's had a change of heart, and this little girl starts dancing. All of a sudden, he's like, oh, man. Well, I'm sorry. But for my own sake, verse 9, and them that sat with him that need, he commanded it to be given her. He sent the head of John in the prison. What a sad. Well, I keep saying it, but brethren, it's never sad when the same of God's going home. And I don't care what the circumstances are. I understand I'm not talking about something unscriptural. I'm talking about a man of God standing. I imagine John was saying, Come on, chop my head off. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go and be with God. Go ahead and put me to death. Now, we're going to end very quickly with what Jesus said about John. What Jesus said about this great, great man of God. So I want to go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. John in verse 2 here said, Jesus is working many miracles. Now remember, we're, we're three chapters before he dies. This is one of those other things people have tried to do. Read the text. This is three chapters before he died. So John is hearing about the works of Jesus. So John sends two disciples and said, Verse 3, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now John had already seen the Spirit descend upon Jesus. He knew we read that among the God. He didn't know who he was at first. Then I knew who he was when I saw that. But this is one of those times when John is looking for confirmation. And by the way, brethren, that's not always wrong. It's not always wrong. We need to have this said Lord for everything. Okay, this is what the Bible's fine showing me. So John said to two of his disciples, it, are, are you really the one? Or do we look for somebody else? And Jesus said, go and show John again the things which you do in him. Hear, hear, hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And so they departed. Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, verse 7, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What is Jesus? Did you go out in the wilderness? To listen to John because he was so fickle that whatever way the wind blew, that's the way John preached. Well, there's a lot of preachers that preach that way, but John not put up. You didn't go out in the wilderness to hear a man preach that every time the wind goes, he changes his message. His message stayed the same all the time. Or he said, Did you go out to see a man clothed, verse 8? In soft raiment, the word there is in e effeminate clothing. He didn't go out in the wilderness to see a cross dresser. That's the way we would say it today. He wasn't one who allowed the wind to change everything that he did. And he wasn't one who sat in a little house in dainty clothes and ate little dainty food, food with his pinky up in there. It's not the John that you read about. The John that we read about, Jesus said, What would you have to see? Verse 9, a prophet. Yea, and I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before me. That's Isaiah. That's Malachi. We've already read that. Verily I, listen to verse 11. Verily I say unto thee. Listen to this. Or I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now drive a peg down there for a moment. Greater than Abraham? He was the father of the Jewish faith. Greater than Moses? He was the great lawgiver. 
greater than Isaiah, Jeremiah, yeah. Doesn't matter who you want to throw out there, there was nobody greater than John. Now drive down the pig because he doesn't finish. John is a great man. Nobody born before the time of Christ and the times that we live was greater than John. That includes Abraham, Moses. Moses, Noah, whoever you want to throw out. But notice that he goes on to say, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know what Jesus just said? Brett, do you realize the blessings that we have in Christ? We can do things that John couldn't do. Well, wait a minute, what are you talking about, preacher? John was not in the kingdom because Jesus hadn't built the kingdom yet. You remember just two chapters later, Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not yet built. So when John lived, the church did not exist. But I want you to know that now we live in the church and we can do greater things than John. What is that? Brethren, you can study with people, baptize people, and get them into the kingdom. Is there anything greater than that? Their sins are remitted. Their name is now in the roll call of God. They are now in God's family. They are now in the church. John's mission, remember what we talked about? A great mission. It was one of the greatest missions ever. But we've got a greater mission. And it's called the Great Commission. And we ought to go because we can help people into the kingdom of God. John could not even do that. So here's the least in the kingdom of God today. And you can be greater than John. If that didn't fire you up to do some work, Reverend, I don't know what will. And so John, he was a great, great man. I'm not going to read the rest of all that Jesus said. We're, we're going to close it up. But Reverend John was not in the kingdom than we are. And we can do greater things than John, but I also want to point out, and I want to point it out very clearly, if you're not in the kingdom, you can't do these great things. So get in the kingdom. Hear the word of God. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess to Christ. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, Rick's going to be leading us in this invitation song. He'll plead with you to respond. As one of God's children, please, if you've got sin, take care of it. If you're subject to the invitation for any reason, please come and stand and ask for sin.